So everyone, in this video, we're going to look at a super important muscle, the tibialis posterior muscle. I'm going to talk about the anatomy of this muscle and the clinical implications that we see when this muscle is problematic in practice. If you're ready to learn, let's dive in. So everyone, let's dive into the main muscle of today's talk, which is, of course, the tibialis posterior muscle. Now, as the name would suggest, tibialis posterior, we can see how this muscle runs down the posterior aspect of the tibia before it swoops to the medial side. But one thing that is really important to mention is how the tendon actually starts a lot higher up the tibia than you may have first thought. In fact, it's almost two thirds of the way down the tibia that the tendon starts rather than right down by the ankle. That's a really important point. So let's head into the origin. And if we fade out this muscle, we can see that it originates from the posterior surface of the proximal tibia, as well as the posterior surface of the proximal fibula. And as you can see in blue, the interosseous membrane, which sits between the tibia and the fibula. So then the tibialis posterior muscle runs down the posterior tibia, as we said, and swoops down towards the medial ankle. Here, it runs through a really important structure, which is the tarsal tunnel, which sits between the medial malleolus of the ankle and the medial calcaneus. And we can remember, of course, that the tarsal tunnel has the flexor retinaculum in blue over the top of it, which almost holds the tibialis posterior tendon down against that area to stop it from fraying too far medially. Now, it's really important to note that the tibialis posterior tendon runs through the tarsal tunnel and underneath the medial malleolus because it means that this part of the bone almost acts as a lever point for the tibialis posterior to work against in order to perform its roles when it contracts. So after it loops inferiorly underneath the medial malleolus, we can see how it almost runs horizontally towards its insertion points on the medial and plantar surfaces of the foot. Now, it does have a number of different insertion points. The first and perhaps its most important one is referred to as the navicular tuberosity, which naturally is a part of the navicular bone. This is suggested to be the main insertion point for tibialis posterior. The tendon then continues to run underneath to the plantar surface of the foot and we, we fade the tendon out, we can see how it attaches to the three cuneiform bones and the bases of metatarsals two, three and four, meaning that when it has such a huge insertion point, it must have a really important role. On to nerve supply. And the nerve supply for this muscle comes from the tibial nerve, from the nerve roots L4 and L5. And then we come to the all-important roles of this muscle. Its movement-based roles include plantar flexion of the ankle and inversion of the ankle. At this point, I would like to mention one of the other key inverters of the foot and ankle, which is the tibialis anterior muscle. Notice how this muscle runs over the dorsum of the foot and inserts into the medial cuneiform and the base of the first metatarsal. This allows us to consider that when the foot is in a plantar flex position, the main inverter of the ankle will be tibialis posterior. But when the foot is in a dorsiflex position, the main inverter will be tibialis anterior. This is so important for our rehab when we consider what position we want the foot to be in when our patient is doing their rehab. Now, in terms of today's topic, we come to the most important additional role of tibialis posterior, which is to act as a dynamic stabilizer of the medial longitudinal arch of the foot when we are walking. So, what is the medial longitudinal arch? This is the set of bones of the talus, the calcaneus, the navicular, the three cuneiforms, and the first three metatarsals, all located on the medial side of the foot, and this creates a height to the medial foot. 
It is really important that we maintain the integrity and shape of this arch as we walk, as it allows for more speed and more natural power. But also because a lack of arch leads to increased flattening of the foot and thus more weight bearing and thus degeneration of the medial foot and ankle. And so once again, the tibialis posterior has a huge role in maintaining the height and stabilizing this arch during walking, which means this muscle is being used with every single step we take. Therefore, we must assess and treat our patients in a weight-bearing position. This is when this muscle takes its most important role, and so we must be able to work on its ability when it is doing its most important role. So when do we find the tibialis posterior becomes dysfunctional in practice? Well, there's two main things to talk about here. The first is a tibialis posterior tendinopathy. This is when we have an overload to the tendon, which can be common in those who have suddenly increased the amount of walking or running that they're doing. Remember, as we said in the anatomy, this tendon is active with every step we take, trying to maintain that medial longitudinal arch. So if we are increasing the amount of running we're doing, let's say, a patient's training for a half marathon and suddenly they need to do a lot more running as a result, we're overloading that tendon by using it more and more and more with every step that we take. So no surprise if it gets tendinopathic and gets irritable because it has to perform its role with every step we take. But then comes the next issue, which tends to have longer and more widespread implications for our patients, which is posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. So as the tibialis posterior tendon starts to fail, we notice that patient's foot position is likely to start changing as well. As you can see here on the screen, when the tibialis posterior is unable to perform its role in holding up the medial arch of the foot, the foot tends to collapse into a position of pes planus, which means a flat foot. Over time, this then develops further into a position of pes plano valgus, where not only do we have the foot arch becoming more flat, but we also have the rear foot collapsing in in a medial position. This can have long-term implications for the foot because as well as losing the arch, we start to develop osteoarthritis in some of the different joints, especially the subtalar joint. And in really progressed cases, we start to see osteoarthritis in the ankle joint as well because the fundamental position of the foot is changed with every step that we take. So it's really important that we spot signs of tibialis posterior dysfunction early so that we can treat it. So on that note, what are some exercises that I use in practice to treat it? Well, at the beginning, in the early stages, if it's really sore and irritable, I have my patients in a non-weight bearing position, particularly in sitting, where I will give them an exercise of isometric or concentric with a TheraBand combined plantar flexion and inversion. By taking the weight bearing element away, it makes the exercise a little bit more comfortable and allows someone to get started with strengthening the tibialis posterior. However, as we said in the anatomy video, the main roles of this muscle come when we are weight bearing. So it's super important that we get our patient up in standing and put them in positions where we ask them to try and work the muscle to lift up and hold the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. Now in this video, it might look quite subtle, but by pushing down through the big toe and in particular the metatarsophalangeal joint of my big toe, I'm really working that muscle to hold up the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. We can progress this further by getting our patient to move whilst trying to hold up the arch. So for example, this rocking backwards and forwards movement allows us to try and hold the arch whilst we're moving the body forwards and backwards, meaning that tibialis posterior has to work harder. And this can be progressed even further with exercises like heel raise, either in a flat position on the floor where we're trying to work the muscle in its plantar flexion and inversion role, perhaps here where we've got a theraband around the calcaneus to try and get the muscle to work harder to perform its role of maintaining the medial longitudinal arch of the foot without allowing the foot to move into a valgus position. 
and we can do some really challenging stuff in the future, such as putting a patient on a decline sideways on a step, asking them to do things like maintaining the position of the medial longitudinal arch in this position, and doing a heel raise, both in positions where the foot naturally wants to move into that position of pes plano valgus, which means that tibialis posterior has to work really hard to maintain the medial longitudinal arch in these positions. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribe to the channel for all our best updates. We've got loads more resources for you on our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio, and on our membership website, member.clinicalphysio.com, link in the description below, we have a fabulous tibialis posterior webinar where we go through all the key anatomy, clinical implications, assessment, and treatment for this muscle and tendon in loads more detail. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.